Uh, and tonight is uh, called Robes of Patience, and it's going to be about the evolution of uh, Buddhist robes or Buddhist monastic garments. Uh, for the most part, I'm going to be just sharing a PowerPoint with you, but I will uh, uh, click back uh, from time to time when I think it's appropriate. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and do that now, just to get us started. All right. So hopefully everybody can see that. Yep, can totally see it. All right, and there's no blank spot? No, and you're on the side, we can see you as well. Okay, great. So then without any further ado, here we go. Um, so this presentation, um, I just wanted to start by saying, you know, that I'm not a monastic. Uh, I have lived in monasteries and I've taken tonsure, which is like I shaved my head and wear, worn some sort of like lay, kind of lay Buddhist robes, but I've been no means have I been ordained. And so what I want you to know is that where this presentation is coming from is actually from uh, my graduate research, or at least my master's thesis research, which was in sort of the evolution of uh, monastic rules, uh, what I'll introduce in a moment as the Vinaya. And I was mainly studying uh, changes and transitions in monastic codes as Buddhism moved out of India and into China. And so kind of looking at the ways that the Chinese adapted the rules of Buddhism for their culture. And a big part of that was looking at the way that the mode of dress changed. And so most, if not all of the research of this uh, presentation comes out of that master's thesis that I did where this is sort of a little side project, which is sort of about Buddhist fashion. Um, and so uh, for anybody that's new in the room tonight, I just wanted you to know that uh, this is the kind of just the general geography that we're dealing with. And this is an evolution of the Buddhist monastic robes. And so I am going to kind of start at the very beginning, uh, or at least the what we know of, the knowledge that we uh, know from as far back as we know. And if you're not familiar with it, Buddhism as a monastic tradition or as an ascetic meditation tradition began in northeastern India, uh, that region of that kind of dot there, it's roughly around the fourth or fifth century BC. I'm not going to get real technical on the history tonight. Uh, I do that sometimes, but this is just a general idea, a very general time and geography frame to think in. And so the idea is that this movement that we know little, very little about in terms of its actual origins. We do know that it eventually started to spread out, uh, out of its kind of point of origin. And as it did, it started to change, headed south, changed even more, headed north, had changed even more. And by around the middle of the second century BC or middle of the third century BC, I should say, you start to have, even at this early date, a, a kind of a splitting of Buddhism into different schools or sects. But I want to make it very clear that these early schools and sects and divisions in Buddhism, they were far more geographical than they were doctrinal or anything else. And what I, I really want to emphasize that, that these schools were not in any way in competition it seems with one another. They really just rep represented different geographies, different locales, and certain um, particularities to that region. And I'll talk a little bit about that as this goes on. And since tonight we're not talking like we, or like I normally do, which is about the Dharma, the Buddhist kind of philosophy and the doctrine and the teachings, tonight we're going to be talking about the monastic code. And this is what is called the Vinaya or Vinaya. Uh, this is just on the right there. This is the kind of seven volume English translation of the Vinaya, just to give you a sense of kind of the, the body of work that we're talking about. This is rather comparable to the collection of sutras in or suttas in the kind of older traditions of Buddhism. And I don't spend a lot of time teaching Vinaya because again, I'm not a monastic, nor am I teaching to monastics. And for householders and lay Buddhists like most of us, the Vinaya or Vinaya doesn't 
really pertain to us because it's about how to live as a monk. And the one thing I want you to know about the, the Vinaya is that there's not just one. And in many ways, that previous slide that I had up, each of those early groups of Buddhism, they all were also defined by having their own uh, Vinaya. And again, what was in those Vinayas, by looking at them carefully, they were not that far apart. And so what I'm going to be focusing on a little bit right now is the similarities. And then we'll start to get into some like differences in these schools. So the, the primary thing that we want to focus on tonight is this idea of the robes of patience. And this is the idea that to be a Buddhist monk or a nun, and I want to be very clear that all tonight's talk goes both for male renunciants as well as female renunciants. But we're talking about renunciation. And in the Buddhist, you know, we, again, we usually talk, or I talk most nights doctrinic, doctrinally about renunciation, conceptually, psychologically, about this idea of letting go, non-attachment, all of those ideas. But when you are looking at the Vinaya and you're looking at the monastic code, you're talking about a lifestyle that is entirely about <laughs> renunciation, like 100%. So we are talking about taking vows of homelessness, to vow not to you know, own a home, rent a home, anything like that ever again. Uh, vows of poverty to, in the early days, to essentially beg for your survival. And, uh, and vows of celibacy, of course. That's kind of a, a premier marker, I guess, of a monastic is the vow of celibacy. But in all Buddhist traditions, pretty much everyone you can find, they all agree that a Buddhist monastic, male or female, is to have eight belongings. They are to have a three-piece robe called a kashaya, and that's going to actually be the focus of my whole talk tonight, is the three-piece robe. But I wanted you to know that in addition to this simple three-piece robe, a monastic is also sort of allowed to possess a, a razor to shave the head twice a month, a begging bowl to beg for food and to receive offerings, a water filter to strain water so as not to consume any bugs, any living creatures, but also just to purify the water, thread a needle to fix your three-piece robe, and a number eight, a belt to affix those items to your being and to keep your robe in place. And that traditionally was it. Those were the only items that a monastic was to, to have. And I'm trying to be careful with my language because they are in a way not to own them nor to have an, a sense of possession or ownership over them. It's simply sort of a sense of use. Uh, and so again, I'm not going to focus on uh, the whole lifestyle of the monastic. Tonight, we are just going to focus on this kashaya, the, the garments, these very distinct uh, mode of dress. Um, and that basically along with the shaved head, it is the distinguishing characteristic of a Buddhist monk or nun. And so I've divided this talk, that was all just the, the preliminary, I've divided this talk into three parts. And the first part, we're gonna talk about the style of these robes. The first thing you should know is that, as I mentioned, this is a three-piece set of robes, and each of these three pieces is a sheet of cloth. Traditionally, um, the, the sizes vary from school to school, but in general, it's just one sheet of cloth that you would wrap around your waist like a sarong. This is called the Antaravasa, or in other um, texts, it's called the Antaravasaka, but it's the basic idea of an undergarment. Um, we might call it the underwear, um, but it is essentially like a sarong if you're familiar with that type of wrap. And over that, is something called the Uttara Sangha, the upper part, Anga. Anga is a, a, a section or a portion or a part, and this is the upper part, the upper garment. And there's a few different ways that a monastic might wear this upper garment. Uh, typically, traditionally, this will be with the right shoulder bare. You see that on the two on the right. 
But the monk can also take that extra portion of cloth uh, that you see on his shoulder on the far right, and he can wrap that extra portion to cover both shoulders. Um, and you'll see that a little bit. But so this is the undergarment under that with the Uttara Sangha or the upper garment covering um, the undergarment. And then the third sheet is called the Samgati. And this is actually a sheet that's twice the size of those other two. Those other two are traditionally the same size. The third sheet is twice the size of those. And it's actually traditionally a double layered sheet because it's essentially a shawl sort of to keep warm. At least traditionally it was a shawl to keep warm, but by the name Samgati, which is sort of similar to our Sangha, this idea of the community or a group of, of monks, what seems to have happened with the Samgati, this great garment, is that that garment in particular, more so than the undergarment and upper garment, the great garment was really the, the, the part of the robe that showed school affiliation, sectarian affiliation. If there was a seniority within a Sangha, meaning students might have a different color than an older senior monk and things like that. So the Sangati is sort of really the key part of the monk's robe. And I just wanted to, uh, oh, and you can also wear this a few different ways. You can fold it up quite tightly and wear it short, or you can unfurl it and wear it long. And in some uh, pictures later on, they will wear it uh, wrapping their entire body. I wanted to show you how this plays out um, sort of in the real world now. This is Ajahn Cha. This is a famous monk of the Thai forest tradition, sort of an essential link in many ways between the past and the present of preserving this uh, tradition. And of course, you can see here that he has his samgati, his great garment, just like in the picture, draped over his left shoulder, his right shoulder bare. He has his upper garment, of course, covering the majority of his body. And we are, of course, to assume that he has the undergarment underneath there. Now we're going to show you even more. This is modern, essentially, you know, uh, 21st century Buddhism in Burma, also a country called Myanmar. And here you can see the monks have, you know, they have flip-flops, uh, but beyond that, they are wearing, again, we are to assume an underpiece, but then they have the main piece. And then you see the samgati, the longer road draped over the shoulder of some of those monks there. And of course, the distinguishing features of the shaved head and the bared right shoulder. And I kind of going to point this out, this bare right shoulder shaved head with the samgati draped over the left shoulder. Because here we are now down in Laos, and this is very similar. They have their begging bowls. You can see that some of the monks in the back have their right shoulder bare, but the ones in the front are wearing their, it's not their samgati actually, it's going to be their, um, just their upper garment draped over their shoulders, and then they're carrying their begging bowls. Now to Cambodia, we see that same style. So again, this portion of my talk is just about the style. And, this, and you can see that whether we're in Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, the bared right shoulder, the shaved head, upper garment, and then the samgati draped over the left shoulder. Um, what you might have already started to pick up on are some slightly different color, um, slightly different colors here. And I, the next section of this talk is about color, but I did just want to point out that often within a single community where you see a variety of color, the color usually can indicate seniority. So in here, the more um, uh, turmeric color, shall we call it, that more earthen yellow color is my guess is and I'm, i don't actually know this particular school of cambodian buddhism but my guess is that those are the students and the more saffron richer browner red like the gentleman with the microphone he's probably the senior monk and you could tell that also again by the uh, colors and now we're going to do one more here. Now we have quite a rainbow in Sri Lanka, as these monks are all apparently off to the cricket match. Um, we can again see a variety of colors, the browns, the saffrons, and our character in the middle there that has almost a purple robe. 
Uh, and again, I'm not, I don't know specifically this school and I'm just showing you these slides to show you the style of dress here that this style that the, that the Buddha laid out 2,500 years ago is still alive and well in these countries in Southeast Asia. All right, so again, this is just the style portion. We are about to get into color because color gets very interesting. So, so far, actually, all the slides I showed you were from this region of what we would call Southeast Asia, right? Burma, Thailand, Laos, Sri Lanka. And it is in Southeast Asia where this very old uh, tradition of Buddhism survives. And by that, I mean three robes only, begging bowl, razor, water strainer, belt, needle and thread. Um, they have preserved this sort of um, the renunciation path um, seemingly you know to a very close degree now for the next portion and actually I will pause there if there's any questions about the style before I move on to the color anybody have questions about that style cool let's talk color so color gets very interesting and we are very, very fortunate to have um, a document. It's a Chinese document, uh, and actually many documents, of a pilgrim, a Buddhist monk named An Shi Gao, or at least in Chinese, his name is An Shi Gao. He died in 180, and about the last 20 years of his life he spent in China, but he's actually from, um, well, today we would call it Iran, uh, but he was from that geographical region of what we would now today call Iran. Um, and he pilgrimaged to China in towards the end of the second century AD. And we're fortunate to have this document in which he recorded or told the people of China that back in India, there are five schools of Buddhism with five different Vinaya traditions, and they each wear five uh, or there's, they each wear a different color robe. And so there were these groups called the Sarvastivadins that wore a very deep red, Dharmaguptakas that were black, Mahasamgikas that wore yellow, Mahashisakas that were blue, and Kashapyas that were a color magnolia. And if you're not familiar with magnolia, that's like a kind of a beige, a very light pale uh, beige. And so... What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to use uh, An Shergao's chart here as a base. And this is a color palette that I want us to start being familiar with. Deep red, black, yellow, blue, and, and, and magnolia. And this is tricky, of course, because I'm trying to do this evolution of, you know, where the robes that we see in the world today, where did they come from? And this is where they come from. And so I want to, again, just I, I introduce this as a palette. And if, if you're not familiar with this, and this is, this is a, uh, I shouldn't even have this slide up. I mean, this is like a lot of history that we don't really need to be going into. But for those of you who are interested, in the year 383, so, you know, quite a while ago, <laughs> uh, there was a council. It was actually the second council of Buddhists in India and the first council happened pretty much right after the Buddha died, in which 500 kind of elders of the tradition got together and formulated the original Vinaya and Sutra collections and all of that. But a number of years later, about 20, 30 years later, there was a second council because there was basically a dispute. And this second council resulted in a split between the Mahasamgikas, which are pilgrim monk An Shirgao mentions as having yellow robes and they split off from this group called the Staviravadins and for all intents and purposes tonight for those of you who are students of Dharma this is sort of the original split between what would be called Mahayana Buddhism and the, Ma and the Mahasamgikas this great Sangha as they're called they are sort of the progenitors or proto Mahayanas. They had some pretty wild ideas about the Buddha, uh, his humanity or non humanity, ideas about bodhisattvas, and all sorts of things that we associate with the Mahayana. 
that group, which actually represented the majority of Buddhists in India at the time, by the way, split off from a much more conservative group, these, uh, the small vehicle or Hinayana, that were represented by the Staviravadins. And the Staviravadins were basically the monastics, the hardcore, keeping it real to the original tradition monastics. And the Mahayanas, the Mahasamgikas, had already started, started to broaden the tradition quite a bit. Um, whereas, again, the Staviras were a little more conservative. Fast forward 500 years, that conservative group of monastics splits into a group called the Sarvastivadins, which our monk on Shirgao mentions as having deep red robes. They split off from a bunch of other groups that all get grouped as a uh, Vijayavadins. And this is a group of a class of Buddhists that were just, they were not down with the Sarvastivadins. They, did, they didn't agree with the Sarvastivadins. They had different doctrinal ideas. And so all of this group on the left, or sorry, on the right, the Theravadins, Kashapyas, Mahishasakas, are all sort of against the Sarvastivadins, but they're still very monastic, very traditional, very conservative, as opposed to the Mahasamgikas. And then finally, because I'm going to be talking about them quite a bit in a moment, that last group, the Dharmaguptakas, were actually who wore black robes. They're actually kind of hardcore Mahishasakas, if you see there. So they're a branch of below even the blue robed wearing Mahishasakas. So again, dangerous slide to throw up with a lot of information, but if anybody's ever been curious about where all these fit in, those are the schools we're gonna, not the schools we're gonna be looking, with, looking at, but actually the color palette. The yellows, the deep reds, sort of beiges, blues and blacks, all right? Quick question. Yeah, yeah, please. So Rasivada tradition, uh, did that, so does that have current antecedents or? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I'm, I'll get there in a second, but you should know that, well, actually, I yeah, just hold on. It, it's like two slides away. Is that okay? Yes. Cool. Um, so I'm going to start with this. If you remember from the ch from the previous slide, these this is like one of the oldest groups around. Like even though they split off from this more conservative Staviravadins, the Mahasamgikas are an old old group, and the name actually means the Great Sangha because. Well, for simplicity's sake, basically the Mahasamgikas, they included like the laity into the Sangha. So it was the monks and the supporters of the monks. So it was sort of the great Sangha. It was all of us versus those more, the Staviravadins, the more conservative group where the Sangha were the monks. And it's like you could support the monks who were the Sangha. So there was sort of that difference, and the, the Mahasamgikas appeared to be that group that was uh, very embracing of uh, the laity, in it, uh, obviously, in addition to the monastics. But the one thing from history that we do know about the Mahasamgikas is that this school diligently studied the collected sutras and that they teached the true meaning. And because they are the source and the center, they wear yellow robes. And this is from a text called the Shariputra Paricha, a very, a very old text that also sort of corroborates Anshagao's uh, color scheme. But it gives us a kind of a, an, a logic or a reason to why this group wore the yellow. Now, this particular yellow we'll see in a, like in the Thai tradition today. And I, I wanna make this very clear. I am not saying that the modern Thai tradition uses the Mahasamgika Vinaya. They don't. They, they, uh, in fact, I'll tell you where they, it gets, where they get their tradition from. So the connections I'm going to be making between these ancient, ancient Buddhist groups and their colors and the modern, I'm not making direct Vinaya connections and saying this group goes all the way back to the Mahasamgikas. What I'm saying is, is that this yellow color the source, the center. This yellow color is going to keep popping up in our palette tonight. 
It pops up in the Thai tradition because they use the more turmeric uh, yellow. But we're going to see a little bit later that even in the Chinese monastic robes, they'll start to use a base of a yellow robe. And so I just want you to see this, the yellow and that connection with a, a really old Buddhist tradition and maybe even a connection with the great Sangha. Okay. So this will get us to the question that was raised a moment ago. So these are the Sarvastivadins. The name Sarvastivada, or actually Sarvasta, is all about a really wild idea, actually. Um, the Sarvastivadins actually broke off or splintered off because of this doctrinal belief. And they believed in the existence of everything. And I don't want to, again, get too into it, but it's kind of an interesting idea they basically believed in the existence of the past, the existence of the present, and the existence of the future. L like that they're real and they're, they're happening, so that the past is not just a, a, a memory or a figment of the present imagination. The past is sort of a real thing that is observable, and the future is a real thing that is observable. So it gets a little deep, and I just wanted you to know that that's where the name comes from. Again, according to our pilgrim monk on Shirgal, the Sarvastivadins wore deep red. And we see that deep red, which actually, if you're using natural dyes, I believe it's saffron versus turmeric, that would get this deeper red color. But we see this deeper red pop up in our Burmese monk. Again, that Burmese monk is not using a Sarvastivadin Vinaya, but that deep red has stayed in the Buddhist tradition. And for the question posed earlier, the Tibetan Buddhist tradition does use a Sarvastivad in Vinaya, and that is why they have deep red robes. Technically, the Tibetan uh, Buddhist tradition is based on the Mula Sarvastivadins, which are a later subgroup of the Sarvastivadins, but that's like really technical stuff. Yes, in this point, the reason why the Tibetans wear the deep red is because of their connection to this Sarvastivadin school. And so this is a modern uh, extant example of the Sarvastivadin deep red robe in the modern world. So that's our red. Now this blue, the Mahisha Sakas. So the, these, according to our text, the Shariputra Paricha, this school practiced dhyana meditation and penetrated deeply and thus they wear the blue robes now what's going to be interesting about this group is again i'm not making any direct connection with their vinaya but i will point out this connection with the blue robe and deep dhyana meditation it's interesting that the japanese soto zen school wears blue robes and i'll get to this uh, blue kind of uh, front piece that he has but not the front piece blue, but even his uh, upper garment there is a blue. And so again, I just want you to see that, the, that this color, this particular color of deep blue is, is still part of the palette of Buddhism, All right? And then our final group, and if you remember the Dharma Guptikas were a subgroup of the previous group of the Mahishasakas. They were so these were also a meditator group, and in many ways, it seems like they just took the deep blue all the way to the black. Their name means Dharma preservers, but it's not that that group was known as the Dharma preservers, it's that they that group was sort of founded, if you will, or it split off uh, based on a monk named Dharma Guptika. And so his sect were the Dharma Guptikas, and it happens that his name means Dharma Preserver. But the black robe is, is interesting because it was the Dharma Guptika Vinaya, the Dharma Guptika monastic code that went to China. And Chinese Buddhist monks wore gray, kind of very dark gray or sometimes black robes, and they were called the black robed ones or those of the black robes. And this black robe of the Dharma Guptika tradition is preserved in the, both the Chinese, although not so much anymore, and the Japanese Zen tradition. And in Japanese, the Keshaya is called a Kesha. 
It's just the Japanese pronunciation of that Sanskrit word kashaya, which is the robe. So those are our, oh wait, we have our fifth color. Oh, this is very important. This color black, what's more important about the black robed Dharmaguptaka Vinaya. And this is true of all the Vinayas, but it is the Dharmaguptakas that really emphasize this. So the Buddha in the Vinaya, the prescription was actually to go to a cemetery, to go to the charnel grounds, to take scraps of material off of corpses, to bring the scraps back, dye them all turmeric, saffron, blue, black, whatever, however, and then stitch those pieces together in kind of like a patchwork fashion. I'm emphasizing this because in the Dharmaguptaka sect, it's not so much the color that seems to have been of interest because we'll, we're, we're going to see in a moment that the Dharmaguptakas uh, have a lot more colors than just black. But what the Dharmaguptakas em emphasized was this patchwork robe, in particular with the samgati, that, that great garment, the outer garment that's twice as big as the others. They emphasized this kind of brickwork pattern to represent that original mandate of the Buddha to cut the, cut the stuff up and sew it together. And the point of this, the point of stitching the clothes together in kind of a patchwork fashion was to look like a beggar. If you're familiar with this Buddhist term bhikshu, like bhikshu that usually gets translated as monk, well, bhikshu means beggar, to beg for food, to beg for sustenance. And so while in some schools, bearing the right shoulder and having the saffron or turmeric robe, in some cultures, that's a sign of poverty. But in other cultures, in particular, Northern India, moving up into Afghanistan and Pakistan, that's where the Dharmaguptakas were really popular. They emphasized the look of the beggar for having this kind of really humble, humble clothes patched together. So I just want to emphasize that about the Dharmaguptakas. Now our fifth and final color is this beautiful magnolia, this kind of beige that's associated with the Kashyapyas. They're also known as the Hamavatas, and that's also Hamava, or that's a name of a region. And this emphasizes it again that most of these schools, what distinguished them was just their location. And yes, because of where they were, they were separated from the other groups, and so they had their different colors. But I don't want to make it seem like these were schisms and sects in that sense. Now, we know from our ancient texts that the Kashapya school were diligent and energetic in guarding sentient beings. And that's an interesting clue, just that little statement there about maybe what this group was all about. Because this very pale beige or white robe even, we see pop up in Buddhism in initiatory robes or the lay Buddhist. And lay Buddhists in Buddhism wear white robes. They often speak of the white robed wearing lay Buddhist. And so this may be, this may come from the Kashapyas, but this pale, uh, kind of a pale robe is also seen in the Chinese tradition. A lot of times the pale gray is for students, initiates, or for going out into the world to do work, like to do service. They'll, they'll kind of, they'll put their uh, more formal robes away and wear these more uh, bodhisattva robes for going out into public. So I just, again, I'm planting seeds of ideas here and, and I'm not, um, Again, the Chinese gray robes are not from the Kashapyas at all. I'm just trying to point out where these pale, gro pale robes still pop up in Buddhism. And so the Korean tradition, which I'm starting to move into East Asia now, they're known for having gray under robes, like the, the upper robe. You can kind of see for some of them that they have white undergarments. Of course, uh, beautiful uh, sneakers purses and all that uh but so this is sort of maybe where that pale 
uh, the guardians of sentient beings. Maybe that's where the pale robe went is to these groups, right? So just hold on to that idea for a while. Any questions about color? Any questions about color? All right. So this is the third and final part. And this is the pattern. So this is going to be the more kind of like the, I think the most interesting part of the talk, where this is kind of where it all comes together, if you will. So going back, we've been to Southeast Asia now, we've been to kind of uh, uh, parts of India. I'm going to focus now on Nepal and Tibet. Also a little bit of Bhutan, but this general region here. As I already mentioned, the, the Tibetans follow the Mula Sarvastivad in Vinaya. This is a group of Tibetan monks. So from, our, from the first part of the talk, right away, you now trained know, oh, deep red. Sarvastivadin, that's where it comes from. Saffron dye, got it. These monks, of course, have um, some gatis. They have saffron or dark, deep red, great robes covering their left shoulder. They have a under their upper garment. You can almost see the undergarment of one of the guys there. But the very interesting thing I want to point out is that little band of turmeric yellow on the right shoulder of the three guys in the center. So this is, this is sort of, it's so subtle. And it's so subtle that you, you might miss it. So I want to point it out. You might have noticed that in Laos, Cambodia, Burma, Thailand, tropical Southeast Asia, where it's hot, they bear the right shoulder. And that's the Buddhist tradition. And they speak often about bearing the right shoulder. And if you're ever in front of a Buddha statue, or if you're ever fortunate enough to see a Buddha, a real Buddha, you bear your right shoulder. But now, of course, Tibet, it's cold. It's a very, very different, different climate in, in Tibet. It's a very different climate in China, all of these other places. And so what I want you to know is that that little band of yellow is the, the, the gesture towards the bare right shoulder. Because they're, the Tibetans are not going to bare their right shoulder, in a sense, because it's too cold to. And so having the yellow there sort of almost creates the optical illusion of a bare right shoulder. But you may also notice, though, that only the three guys in the, in the middle have it. And my presumption on that is that that's a sign of initiation and that the three monks in the middle are probably the senior monks, higher initiated, and the other five monks are probably student monks. So again, you know, take all of that um, as speculative there, but do notice that band of yellow that is, it's not speculative, it is serving as that bare right shoulder. Here is Bhutan, my favorite picture of Bhutan, looking like a rock band, right? And so here you also see the saffron, the deep red, Mula Sarvastivad and Vinaya, yes, on pretty much all of them, more or less, you see that yellow band representing the bare right shoulder. And then you have the, the great garment draped over the left shoulder, which is a slightly different red, a slightly different red, uh, deeper red than the undergarment, or I should say the upper garment. And then you'll, again, you'll notice some slightly different colorings, which probably represent seniority, because most of the times when Buddhists stage photographs like this, the guy in the middle is the most important. And so you will notice that he has that deeper, uh, almost leaning towards back towards that turmeric yellow, that brown robe, right? So Bhutan practicing a very similar type of Buddhism to Tibet. Nepal also practicing a very similar type of Buddhism to Tibet, also using a Mula Sarvastivad in Vinaya. Here you see a bunch of uh, the uh, kind of children also having the yellow 
to, again, kind of represent that bare right shoulder that we saw going on uh, in Southeast Asia, right? These are the Tibetan nuns. Uh, you see them, their beautiful shaped heads. Also uh, having the, you can see actually in a few of them that they have what look like orange undergarment, the saffron red upper garment. And then of course this beautiful woman with her uh, Samgati, her great garment draped on her head. The other ones have the yellow draped on their shoulders. And so this is, this is very interesting here. The yellow Samgati, the yellow great garment, which by my estimation is harking back to that Maha Sam, Sam, Samgika, the yellow robed wearing, the original old school group of yellow robed wearers potentially this is where that's coming from. So we're Sarvastivadin or Mula Sarvastivadin. We wear red robes, but we have this yellow robe as our great robe. And now we see this group of uh, Tibetan monks also with their saffron under or upper garment, but then the Samgati, the great garment draped over, full regalia here where it's covering kind of their whole body that way, the yellow, right? there. There's the Dalai Lama. There again, we see that token of seniority, that, that more turmeric brown Samgati. He's got the saffron upper garment and then on the right shoulder, that little band of yellow to, again, create that illusion of the bare right shoulder, right? Now, Tonight's not the night to get into uh, esoteric Vajrayana Buddhism. Of course, Tibetan Buddhism is its own type of Buddhism. And even though it's based on this very, very old Mula Sarvastivadin Vinaya, the Dharma of Tibetan Buddhism is, is quite advanced. It's, it evolved quite a bit. And so here, so now, you know, at the beginning of this talk tonight, this picture may not have made a lot of sense to you, but hopefully now you can see like, oh, okay, he, the guys on the sides, they have their turmeric kind of brown, turmeric yellow, some got these on their shoulders. They've got the yellow band on their right shoulder. They've got the saffron uh, upper garment. These hats are interesting, and these are going to be some culturally specific hats to Tibet. Of course, you will not see these in any other type of Buddhism than Tibetan Buddhism. The guy in the middle, of course, is our main guy. You can tell by the hat. But look at his white samgati. So he has a white samgati, which, you know, that's something special. You'll notice the Vajra bell and the guy next to him holding a kind of a begging bowl. But it, 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 he's not begging for offerings, right? They're performing a ritual. They're chanting mantras. The guy on the right, he has a sheet, a, a scroll with mantras, they're chanting, they're ringing the bell, and the begging bowl, they're kind of making prayers and hoping for offerings of the gods, you know, not money and leftovers, if you know what I mean. So I just wanted to point out that even as esoteric as Tibetan Buddhism gets, they still have underneath it that three-piece robe with that same kind of color palette. Mongolia is a kind of a class unto itself, and I'm not going to go into, into it by the saffron, by that color red. You guessed it. They, too, use a Mula Sarvastivad in Vinaya. They are basically a form of that style of Tibetan Buddhism. You should know that, of course, Mongolia sort of uh, became uh, esoteric Buddhist or Vajrayana for quite a long time. That's uh, represented here by the, their kind of Tibetan style of robes. But the actual style of the robes is a little more Chinese with these large um, uh, cuffs, the blue cuffs, which were kind of very beautiful. Uh, so I just wanted to point out that Mongolia is kind of an interesting hybrid of Tibetan and Chinese Buddhism. So this picture um, might come back to it later because it might make more sense. But again, just wanted to point out that in those sort of, uh, in those regions, they're using that saffron red or that deep maroon. Uh, I'm going to move to a different region. Any questions about that? Cool. 
So now we're going to get to a whole new group. And what we're going to start talking about is this transmission of Buddhism out of India, kind of out of Southern Asia and into East Asia. And Buddhism comes to China and Korea and Japan. It comes to East Asia through uh, the Khyber Pass, through Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, and then across what is called, you know, used to be called the Silk Road across the Gobi Desert. And so in Central Asia, uh, there's a oasis town I talk a lot about in my lectures called Dunhuang, very important uh, spot in the history of Buddhism. This is a, a mural, in a, a cave mural in a Dunhuang from the, about the fourth century or so. It's a very famous, uh, this particular image is very famous because it shows a very uh, round-eyed, very hairy, uh, kind of so-called Westerner on the left encountering a very almond-eyed, hairless Asian monk on the right. So this is a kind of a very famous image for this East meets West. But you will, of course, notice that they are both wearing Buddhist robes. And in particular, they are wearing robes indicative or representative of the Dharma Guptika Vinaya. And of course, you will notice right away, they're not black. And I wanted to emphasize that, that in particular, the Dharma Guptikas, eh, the color, fine, sometimes black, whatever. But more importantly, it was this patchwork pattern. And so you can kind of see the, the, that these robes coming through, uh, you know, Central Asia, coming from Afghanistan and Pakistan, what is called Gandhara back in the day, those robes are looking pretty fancy, right? Which is a little ironic, of course, because this patchwork fashion was supposed to be representative of poverty. I'm about to show you some real life uh, uh, samgati, some great garments of this patchwork style, right? So this is a Japanese one, beautiful, uh, great garment, obviously not black. Pattern, beautiful, obviously not black. This is a beautiful one that actually has images of Buddhas and bodhisattvas in each of the panels. This is kind of bordering on that. Uh, turmeric brown, kind of reddish brown, but also with the patchwork pattern, uh, with these kind of, um, you know, seemingly random large patches, but there's actually a whole code to all of this. Um, I decided not to get into this tonight for the lecture, but within the tradition of the Dharma Guptika, there's a whole code depending on how many patches you have shows seniority, shows initiation into higher traditions, gets very interesting. Now let's take it back. This is our Ajahn Chah, Thai forest tradition, using the uh, Theravadin, a very, very old Vinaya, very traditional, great garment draped over the side, like I said, very bare right shoulder, coarse shaved head, full lotus posture. On the right, we have Kodosawaki. He's a Japanese Zen Buddhist, very famous um, for kind of popularizing Zen in the 50s and 60s. You'll notice, of course, their posture almost identical. Shaved head, uh, the mudras are slightly different, but the hands in the lap. But our Kodosawaki on the side here, I hope you can see the stitching. I hope you can see the patchwork of his robe on the uh, of his great garment. These, you know, are kind of identical images, but they just show that cultural almost uh, climate. You know, like I said, it's it's it gets colder in East Asia than it does in Southeast Asia, and so you have your more kind of traditional Asian Chinese robe underneath the great garment, but you can even see how there's an undergarment, a much lighter undergarment, and then an upper garment, and then again, the stitched together uh, samgati, the stitched together great garment on the side. So fascinating, of course, that these two traditions, the Zap Japanese Zen tradition and the Thai forest tradition, 
These couldn't be further apart in geography, culture, language, time, space, you name it. And the fact that these traditions are in, in 1960, Ajahn Chah was active in 1960 as well. So in 1960, the idea that these traditions were contemporaneous and even though culture, they'd gone through some changes, there's still such continuity, you know, between the two. It's, it's, it's really amazing. All right. So now that we're moving into East Asia and I've introduced this sort of um, Chinese style robe, I hope that when you see an image like this, you see the bared right shoulder, even though this person does not have in any way, shape, or form a bared right shoulder. But, they, but within the Asian tradition, they very much, or East Asian tradition, they very much have a bared right shoulder. So here you can see he has a gray or white antaravasa, the undergarment. You, it's kind of peeking out right at his neck there. The main robe, the Uttara Sangha, his upper garment, is black. That is indicative of that Dharma Guptika Vinaya, which the Zen tradition uses. It's called the four part Vinaya of the Dharma Guptikas. And so the Zen tradition adopted the black robes and again adopted that patchwork uh, fashion. Here you have the yellow Samgati, the great garment, very similar if you remember our Tibetan nuns and our Tibetan monks. They had the red underneath, but they had the yellow great garment. Here we have a yellow great garment. In East Asia, they adopted this decorative circular clasp, and you're about to see this pretty much in most of the rest of the images. Uh, and so this is sort of an East Asian addition. Um, you kind of don't obviously see this in the, in the Southeast Asian traditions. This is another type of uh, Chinese robe, um, also probably a gray or white undergarment, the yellow. So now it's kind of flipped, right? We've got the yellow undergarment, but this very dark brown, you know, in some uh, schools it borders on black, but this brown Sangati great garment also done in patches with the circular clasp. This is a Taiwanese style. So this is where they have, they will have a gray or white undergarment. They have the black on the, you know, the main upper garment you see there is black. And then the dark brown Samgati done in patches with the circular clasp. This is a Taiwanese. You also would see this in mainland China, by the way. This is the abbot. So this is a senior very, very senior monk. This is an honorific robe for this, the abbot, the senior most monk or senior most monks of a monastery. Uh, they actually ignore, ignore his uh, beefy tee, his Hanes t-shirt. Ignore that. The, a proper way to wear these robes is that you would have a turmeric brown undergarment, the much more bright yellow upper garment, and then a red samgati done in patches with gold thread, the circular clasp. And I want to just show you, this is, these are three senior monks dressed in this, the honorific robes, right? What's fascinating about this particular set of robes is that the red, the red is a reference to the Tibetans. It is a reference to the Mongolians. It's a reference to the Yuan dynasty, which was this period in which China was very Tibetan in that way, very, or Mongolian and very uh, uh, influenced by esoteric Vajrayana Buddhism. And so they actually, if the senior most monks, abbots of the monastery are initiated, into these esoteric rites, they get the Mula Sarvastivadin deep red robe that they are wearing over that original Maha Samgika, Great Sangha, Salt of the Earth yellow robe, right? So there's, it's, you know, the whole history, the evolution of the robes are all taking place here. And, and again, even though it doesn't look like it, 
these guys have their right shoulder bare. They're in a temple. They're probably doing circumambulating a Buddha, praying and have their right shoulder bare. And just to note the little mala, the, not little, those are kind of big. Uh, the mala beads, it's kind of an interesting thing wearing the mala beads around the neck. In some traditions, that's a no-no. In some traditions, only the abbots get to do that. So I just wanted to point that out about that little accoutrement of the, the mala bead. G given everything I've told you now, this picture should be fascinating. This is a monastery in Taiwan, and it should be very clear to you what's going on. We, of course, on the, on the periphery, we have some lay Buddhists in street clothes, fine. The majority are student monks. They have gray undergarments, black upper garments, and brown, uh, uh, some got these brown great garments. These more higher initiated or senior nuns, it looks like actually, uh, these are all nuns, uh, maybe a few monks, but it looks like the group in the front are nuns. We have our senior nuns in the black robes with the yellow great garment on the side, and then the abbot standing out in the middle with that Mula Sarvasti Vaden deep red royal robe. So a picture like this, you can tell who's who. This is kind of very, um, oh, it's a very kind of Asian, East Asian style, which is that to be able to very quickly uh, delineate who's who, you know, who's above who, who should bow to who, the robes really help in these kind of monastic situations. And finally, in East Asia, there is a tradition of the uber uber honorific purple robe so you know in many ways this is like deep red you know it's all of it this this purple color purple is a you know traditionally it's the royal color you know whether it's the queen of england or prince the musician purple is you know the royal color and so the purple robe uh here he the the Whoever would have the purple robe would probably be wearing the turmeric brown undergarment, this yellow upper garment, and then the purple great garment done in patches, that nod of the hat to the Dharma Guptaka, putting it into patches, gold trim, and the decorative circular clasp. This is a Japanese uh, monk, clearly you know a uh, high monk honorific purple robe just wanted you to show that uh and the monk next to him has like this a uh, gold samgati that not the one on the left but the one on the right kind of um i guess yeah the guy in the glasses i think that's a guy i don't think that's a nun but that's a nice gold samgati i will tell you that all right now so we're gonna keep going through east asia and looking at the Korean style robes now. This is a student, nun. Now, I pointed out a number of slides ago that that magnolia, that pale, you know, almost white robe may have been held over in these traditions uh, where the undergarment is white, the upper garment is gray, and the samgati is brown done in patches. Uh, this is more of just a simple knot uh, versus the clasp. This is a group of Korean student monks. Also the gray upper garment, uh, but this kind of more uh, reddish brown gray garment. Also with the clasp or a knot. I couldn't, I couldn't, I can never resist. They're too cute. Uh, but also, again, you see the gray with that red uh, that deep red or that brownish red. Uh, this is the Vietnamese tradition. And now if you noticed from the map, uh, Vietnam or Vietnamese Buddhism is, is very East Asian, very looking like Korea, very looking like China and Japan. Doesn't look like its neighbor, Thailand, Burma, Laos. And that's because Vietnamese Buddhism came from China not from India, not from Southeast Asia. So they preserve that kind of, of course, East Asian style. Here you see 
for the most part, they're wearing dark brown upper garments with the turmeric yellow great garment. Uh, the students, there's a few students there that have very bright yellow. That's this. This is a kind of initiate. Uh, also the gray white undergarment, the gray upper garment, and then the very, very yellow samgati done in patches. And now I wanted to go talk about the blue. This is our, uh, there's, if you didn't know, there's three, three main sects of Japanese Zen. And yes, Zen is a subsect of Buddhism, but uh, in Japan, you'll find the Soto Zen, the Rinzai Zen, and Zen. Um, they all wear dark robes, uh, part of that Dharma Guptika tradition, which is the Vinaya they all use. But in the Soto tradition, they're known for having, uh, yeah, gray, white undergarments, but the blue upper garment and dark blue or black great garments. But what is it in addition here is the uh, Rakusu, which that I call, this is just what I call it, a mudra bib. And that's exactly what it is. It's kind of a crass way of putting it. But if you're familiar with these hand gestures called mudras, right? Well, in the esoteric um, Buddhist tradition, where they recite mantras, maybe use uh, visual aids like mandalas, they also do the ritual hand gestures called mudras. And I already mentioned that for a while, uh, China became very Vajrayana, became very esoteric. Uh, style Buddhism and that esoteric esotericism that style of Buddhism that uses mantras and mudras it's it stayed and one area where it stayed was in this mudra bib and so what's interesting about the Zen tradition in particular the Soto Zen is that they use these bibs to cover their hands while they make the mudras and that's the general idea around that is, is that the mudras are secret and you have to be initiated to learn how to do them. And so you don't want somebody walking by to be able to see the mudra. And so it's a, it's a screen or a shield to cover your secret mudra making. And even though the Zen tradition in general is associated with just seated meditation, this mudra bib is a like a, an interesting holdover from when Buddhism was when all of East Asian Buddhism was much more esoteric or Vajrayana in that way. This is a I believe a Rinzai, but I'm not a hundred percent on that. Um, I believe he's Rinzai, not Sutta Zen. Uh, but he has he would most likely have a gray or white undergarment. You see, he has a black. Uh, upper garment. To my knowledge, he is not wearing his um, uh, great garment, his samgati, but he is wearing a gray mudra bib. And then you see him there with his uh, black um, begging bowl. So this image, of course, is interesting. This is a modern day Japanese Zen monk. You know, and of course, it looks very Japanese, but hidden under all of that, you know, is our original eight belongings of the monastic, you know, his robe, his begging bowl, and all of that. The hats are interesting, but we've already seen with Tibet that the introduction of culturally, uh, culturally specific hats. So the hat is kind of one thing, but in general, that's your classic Buddhist monk. And this is pretty much, I believe, the more or less the last slide I have. And this is a Japanese Shingon, which is a Vajrayana, Tantric style Buddhism. And this is, this is as, 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 as complicated, almost as complicated as it can get. You see the white undergarment. You see the black upper garment. You see the yellow Samgati. Um, he does have a knot. You can't quite see it. You see the black mudra bib that has the name Koyasan, uh, the name of his temple. You see he has the Vajra bell. You see he has the begging bowl. And he's got the mala beads. So it's, 
add all the accoutrement, the, all of the robes, all of the traditions. I mean, he's really just missing a little bit of red uh, in that way. But I did want to just put these two images side by side really quickly to finish the um, kind of the more uh, luxury part of the talk off. These are both practicing Vajrayana esoteric tantric Buddhism, the Tibetan style, the Japanese style. But I want you to see that there are some similarities. The guy in the, the, the monk in the red hat with the Vajra bell, he's got mala beads. The, the Japanese monk, he's got the mala beads. Japanese monk has a Vajra bell. Tibetan monk has a Vajra bell. The Tibetan monk's a little busy, so he's not holding the begging bowl. He has a, a, another monk holding his begging bowl. But you see that there's this, um, um, I mean, it's a begging bowl, but in both instances, neither are begging for food. Neither are begging for leftovers. The Japanese monk is also begging for, for peace. You know, I don't, I don't know how else to put it. You know, they're out there, you know, he may take, uh, the Japanese monk may take coins or change in there. But in general, my point is that, that these are gestures towards an older tradition of tr like, of, uh, of, well, I, I was about to say true renunciation in that sense of like actually not having a home, actually relying on leftovers. And I don't want to make it sound like these are not true renunciants in that way. But I just want to make the point that the begging bowls are not necessarily being used for that same uh, austere purpose that they once had. Uh, this monk, uh, the Japanese monk, is chanting mantras. The Tibetan monks are chanting mantras as they ring the bell, as they move the mala bead, um, and as they practice their esoteric form of Buddhism. Uh, and also pointing out the culturally kind of specific hat that the, the doli, as it's called, this like the, the rice paddy field hat of the Japanese, making him sort of look like a field peasant beggar and these sort of uh, very interesting Tibetan hats that, as I understand it, are part of a much uh, more indigenous uh, Tibetan tradition, religious tradition, this uh, Bon tradition. Um, and the way in which that indigenous tradition and Buddhism melded together. Um, so there's a lot going on in that last frame. But that, my friends, is the end of my talk. I'm going to try to get out of here so that I can see you all. Hello. We're here. Okay. I, I honestly just was like, no way. Did I just do that whole thing for nobody? Wow. So that's good. Can uh, I ask this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, let me hold on one second. I'm trying to get. Do you want to stop sharing your screen, Michael? Yeah. I okay, here. I think that. I can do that from here. Okay. Oh, hi. <laughs> Cool. Okay. Cool. Now, questions, ideas. Got a question. Yeah, Tanya. Hi. Hi. Um, so I was just struck by the picture, the last picture of the Japanese um, uh, monk and his bowl. The bowl looks a lot like the bowls that we strike when we do meditation. Mm -hmm. Is it related? Uh no, that one's going to be an actual, like, um, kind of uh, fire that you would potentially eat out of, whereas those that we ring, um, it would probably be offensive to put anything in those. Okay. The ones, yeah, one, bowls, bowls that are played are, are usually uh, not used for, for alms that way. Yeah, okay. and that's actually why... It's the Vajra bell. So the, the bowl isn't serving as a musical instrument like, like we do at the Zendo or at the meditation hall. Thanks. Yeah. 
Any other questions? I have a question about dye. Um, yeah. I, I understand that the, the sort of first proliferation of different colors corresponded to different geographical areas where different groups of Buddhists sort of were over the course of a few hundred years. And is it, do you suppose that the different colors, at least initially, were because, oh, yeah, in this part of India, we use saffron because that's what's plentiful kind of thing, you know? And then it, it sort of developed meaning after that, or I'm asking you to speculate, I think. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would really be speculating. Um, but my speculation, though, um, you know, it's, and it's an educated guess in that regard. I don't know the last time you've ever tried to, you know, went out and buy some turmeric, and last time you tried to buy some saffron. Saffron's a little more dear, right? Yeah. yeah. It's a lot more dear. And yeah. so my educated guess is actually that if you notice the higher, more senior you got, the closer you got to saffron, that's in Southeast Asia. Yeah. My guess is, is because those robes were, were dyed with saffron and it was more expensive. And turmeric was, it's a, it's a root. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, you know. So my guess is, is that, that the use of the different dye was a mark of, of um, value, but, you know, like I'm going to resell, the, resell yeah. the robes or anything, um, but of quality in that way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I had been very curious about this question and attempted to research it and didn't find much information. So thank you very much for putting this together. Oh, cool. Um, and uh, a, uh, a question that some understanding that I came away with from reading random things online was that there was some interpretation of the initial instructions that, that uh, kind of brown was maybe what was specified or that in, in that the instructions were to take garments that there was maybe uh, that the sort of initial color mm. could have been interpreted to have been like a or I remember reading something about that it was like like take the, the garments of uh, possibly deceased people and then kind of dye them in such a way that they end up being a kind of like mix of multiple colors and end up being a brown I, I just noticed that that didn't come up here and I wondered if. Yeah, that, that's actually, there's two things in that that I meant to say, and then I just launched right in. One was that the original injunction of the Buddha was nudity, that renunciation meant renunciation. And so there was a period in which they were kind of Jain uh, uh, style where they went naked. And then there's a story about how one of the monks was begging and it was, um, the story is that it was, uh, he, it was dark, he was like out too early or something, and he was nude and he basically almost gave a woman a heart attack because she thought he was some kind of monster or who knows what the story really means, uh, like what really transpired or happened. But after that, the Buddha said, all right. We, we're going to wear clothes, but here's how we're going to do it. And like the, the gentleman just said, the injunction was you go to the cemetery, get the get material. And then the idea was like, I've heard a few different things. One was like, yeah, kind of like th the way that like brown is just like all the colors mixed. It's just like, blah. What I've heard is that the idea, the original, again, the original injunction, it was about them being ugly. It was kind of about them not being pleasing to the eye, not being desirable, so that nobody would be like, oh, I want to be a Buddhist so I can have those fancy robes. So the idea was for it to be kind of, dis not displeasing in that way, but just really, really sattvic, I guess, like really bland, really benign in that way and then I, it, like so many rules the way they're written the way they're phrased it goes and becomes um different things in different places in that regard meaning that um or, or like i was saying with the dharma guptikas where they seem to put more emphasis on the idea of stitching them together and that that was the sign of poverty not the color but the the patchwork 
So, yeah. Anything else about that? So, Michael? Yeah, Eric. What you're see saying is that there's no like scriptural reference to the colors of whatever the Buddha wore? As far as I know, all we have are these commentaries from monks like An Shigao and much later texts like that Sariputra Pacha text or whatever um, that talk about these different groups and the colors they were. But as far as I know in the Vinaya, it's just some general remarks about this brown or yellow or what have you. Okay. And then and then again the natural the natural dyes that were used to make them. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I have another question, but happy to let someone else go. Anybody else? Looks like you got the floor. Um, yeah, I mean, I maybe less a question, but what one of my interests was um, like, in what way could one dress today, especially in a non-Asian context, in a way that's in the spirit of this? And uh, the one sort of example I had is I spent some time with Monastic Academy, and I understand that they've done some thinking about that and dress in a way that doesn't look much like it looks somewhat different than Asian styles. And uh, I would love to see a collection of sort of like modern, modern interpretations. Where like, what's the what's the bleeding edge in a way? <laughs> yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And, and in fact, that's an thank you again because that's another thing that I I forgot to say at the top of this talk, which is the other reason why I the the research for this came out of my uh, like I said my graduate stuff. But the reason why I actually put this talk together for the public was for the American Buddhist audience. And what I wanted was to, you know, and you might, have, you might have noticed that the way I taught this was, you know, it was more of these motifs and these ideas and not so much about specific schools and things like that. Because my hope was, is that as American Buddhists, that as we translate and interpret this thing, as we are currently presently doing, um, we need to know all this. All, so many other cultures have already been through this, where they've gotten the Dharma, they've gotten the Vinaya, they've processed it, they've, been, they've rejected stuff, they've changed stuff, and they've made it their own. This has happened so many times, and so I want to kind of be that historian that's like, hey, we've been here before, guys, so here's the, here's the deal. We should probably make a token gesture to the bare right shoulder. That seems to be, you know, a part of it. Um, three part robe, definitely, you know, th so I don't care if it's three pieces of denim, right? I got, you know, but the idea is, is that it would seem, you know, and of course, I'm not going to make any rules here, but if we want to learn from all these past Buddhist cultures and the way that they, um, well, in particular, I think what's most interesting is to see what they found was essential and what they found as, you know, that you, you know, that's, you can get, you can get rid of that, but you can't mess with this. So like the three part robe, that was essential. And, and from a very early time, the, the three part robe, you know, came to be symbolic of the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, the three treasures, um, and all the other wonderful, beautiful things that are in threes in Buddhism, the three-part robe became part of that as well. And so again, I would think that as American Buddhists, um, as we consider or think about developing an American vinya or an American renunciatory path tradition, um, that we, yeah, we should think about those things that were, that were preserved. Or again, like the, the East Asia where they, they make the gesture of it. You know, they're not going to literally take their, their, you know, and I'm not going to do that either. But to have that token gesture, things like that, right? So mm -hmm. thanks again for that question. Great, great co or comment. Great comment. <laughs> Anybody else? Anything else? You know everything you need to know about Buddhist monastic garments now. I guess I would throw out that I'd love to have a conversation about that sometime also. Of like what we could do? 
Yeah, I think I've been had a lot of thoughts and it seems to make it be fun. Uh, I mean, since we're opening the room up afterwards and if there's no more questions, we could throw around a few things or just spitball if anybody's interested. Any other questions if we, before we I, do that? I just, I just I had a quick question and I, and I missed the beginning part. So if this is, you know, yeah. obnoxious, you know, you just, you know, but um, did they, it, so were other uh, renunciatory folks of the time Deciding to wear robes, or were they in in cargo shorts, or what was the what was the thing for that? Boy, I'll tell you, that's that's a another great question. Wow, such great questions. So, uh, this is something that's much more than an educated guess. It's sort of it wasn't my thesis, my master's thesis, like my actual like position or thesis, but very close to my thesis, and. What it was, was that at the time of the Buddha, yeah, there were, you know, so many different uh, renunciatory paths, so many different teachers. But in general, it seems from what loose scan, you know, historical documents we have, you know, it seems that the general mode of, of um, decorum or comportment, if you will, for renunciants was you let, you let your hair grow till it got Nazi dreads. <laughs> right? Dreadlock. And only, only if your guru, your teacher died, would you shave your head as a sign of mourning. Mm -hmm. But you'd, then you'd start growing them back out again. And so Nazi dreads, um, you'd grow your fingernails really long. You, it's a tradition just to let them go, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. They would, you know, go to the charnel grounds, maybe rub some ashes on their naked bodies or what have you. Um, you know, maybe they're wearing kind of sarongs or loincloths but my point is at the time of the buddha to be a renunciant was to be like you know uh you let it go you you let it you let it all go in that way and my thesis in that sense was that what made buddhism quite seemingly unique at the time and definitely the unique feature that allowed it to spread out, the Buddha seems to have been, um, you know, smart enough or, or enlightened enough. I don't know how, how to think about it, but um, he initiated a dress code. Shaved head twice a month and these orange, brown, whatever color robes. And the idea was, is that now we have a Sangha and we all have the same color robe and we're all shaving our head on the new moon and the full moon. And this uh, cohesion, this, um, oh, uh, heterogeneity, shall I say, right? This like, oh, that seems to have been a unique feature of Buddhism where, just to put it bluntly, the, Buddhist, the Buddha seemed to have cleaned up the act of the renunciant, if that makes sense. In particular, this, you know, a lot of the vinaya, a lot of the vinaya is hygiene. And so these were very hygienic. It's sort of like a new style of, of asceticism and renunciation in that way, where you have a dress code, a hairstyle, a hygiene. And it, it seems that it's that unique dress code feature of Buddhism that allowed it to spread out. Um, whereas these other groups, that were, you know, naked dudes with dreadlocks. That it didn't become a, a style. I mean, it's a style in India, but it didn't, doesn't seem to have transcended, you know, outside of India in that way, or at least not as a cohesive, heterogeneous group in that sense. So, Brendan, that was you, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, and it sounds like it has to do with, like, a rejection of the world, which some of those other renunciatory paths sort of we're dealing in and this was this middle path of in embracing it sort of <laughs> detached yeah. <laughs> yeah you said it man it's the it is the middle path the other guys were letting their hair uh go wild uh rich people getting a haircut every day once a week whatever the buddha said how about twice a month how about we get a haircut twice a month 
And then it's like, these guys are going naked. That's, re- that's super renunciatory just to give up all your clothes. And by the way, not just to give up all your clothes, but to give up the, the shame, right? To give up the, you know, that, those are two different things. To just give up belonging, to give up the belongings of clothing, that's one thing. But to give up that ego self-identity that's ashamed of your naked, that's a whole other thing to give up, right? Hmm. So, yeah, the renunciatory path was about giving that up. Once again, the Buddha came in, middle path. How about we just wear the same thing for the rest of our life? (laughs) How about I give you three sheets of cloth and you just wear that for the rest of your life. <laughs> now that, that to us might seem quite renunciatory, and it is. But at the time, that was the middle path. Uh, renunci- renunciation at the time of the Buddha also meant fasting. Trying basically to serve the body into submission. The Buddha said, how about one meal a day? How about one meal a day? So the middle path cuts all the way through this but it's an interesting um it's an interesting location of the middle path uh if if you know what i mean that that by our eyes it might still seem quite renunciatory to only eat one meal a day to wear the same thing for the rest of your life to wear have the same haircut for the rest of your life that might seem quite renunciatory but for for the buddha at least at the time that was the the middle road nude and wrapped in blankets sounds kind of comfy but um have you ever but, put on have you ever put on just three sheets and like mimicked it no like, no but uh, when i when i first started studying this i was like what's that like you know so i got out my three towels three big sheets and you know dressed up and i was like wow that would be wild to just wear that like you know it'd be comfortable in a certain sense but Also, you, you don't have to worry about what you're wearing. So it's like a huge thing where, and, and, and about focusing energy towards the, the goal kind of thing. But also s- separates you from the rest of, of people. And so, and so it, both growing the hair and the nails, it's like, whoa, I'm not going to get near that, getting near that guy. But also it's like, yeah, don't get near me because actually what I want to do is meditate or whatever, you know? <laughs> But also, so the robes are like, you know what, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a whatever grain merchant. I'm not a, like, you know, that my thing is, you know, to be of service or to meditate or to follow the path. And so it's also a marker for, for, for society, right? It's like, right. Cause I mean, it's, it's talk about style, right. It's how you're perceived, right. Oh, uh, yeah. Not only within the Sangha, but also in the context of, of society. Um, I keep going back to robes of patience, right? The name of the chat. So, you know, can you chat about that? I don't, I don't you know, pay, pay, you know what, what, do you, what do you mean by that when you, when you, when you call the chat, uh, talk uh, rob, robes of patience? <laughs> uh, well, it's not my phrase. That's a Buddhist euphemism for the, that the robes are, are, not necessarily like robes to keep you warm or to make Uh, you look good they're robes of patience right and it speaks to a lot of the talk about renunciation that we Mm. talked about tonight but in in a lot of the dharma talks talked about you know which is that you know buddhism is this very interesting path when it comes to when it comes to renunciation and this world Mm. and what and what i mean by that is is that you know some renunciatory traditions are very down on this sensual world. Mm. You know, the whole mission is to get as far away from the sensual world as possible and as deep into meditation as possible or as high into a heavenly realm as possible or what, what have you. But mm. like, you don't want to be messing around in the sensual realm, mm. kind of an idea. Mm. Buddhism's, Buddhism's kind of a unique path because it's actually not in any way a form of escapism and I'm not calling those other uh, uh, traditions escapist. Mm -hmm. But what I mean is, is that the idea is that the emphasis is not about transcending the sensual world. It's about actually being deep in the sensual world and having Kashanti, having Mm. that patient. 
this word kishanti mm. is um you know a tricky one it gets translated as patience but it's kind of a patient endurance it's like mm. you know a real slow burn of of, mm -hmm. of patience for you know for a lot mm -hmm. and and in particular going back to what i was just saying in the face of it mm. you know in the face of the sensual desire right. not you know in the seventh heavenly realm you know mm. <laughs> but you know walking the streets and so that all speaks to that idea of robes right. of patience it also mm. speaks to what i mentioned a moment ago which is you're making a choice to wear the same thing right. for the rest of your life right that takes a degree of patience sure <laughs> yeah, I, I also love this idea of like a seed for, I don't know, how, but for lack of a better word, a, 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 an American monastic tradition, right? So it seems that everywhere that Buddhism moves historically, it, it, it sort of adapts or, or be, there's something about the place that, that informs uh, the way the, the evolution of the robes and presumably the practice, you know, whether you're bearing the right shoulder or not or whether it's just symbolic because it's cold in tibet and nepal and what have you but yeah so it really is is a very fascinating question and what would the american quote unquote school right quote unquote, uh uh look like you know right that's that's i like that's the denim i think this is <laughs> a good, a good the blue jean buddha <laughs> i mean an american Awesome. Exactly right. What's more, what's more American than blue jeans? There you go. That's great. It's an interesting, very fascinating to think, right? You know, next whatever two, three hundred years, how that that might evolve from this idea. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. All right. So I'll call that the official end of the talk talk. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but if we do want to spit, spitball American Buddhist uh, monastic ideas, that, that's fun too. But just for right now, I do want to thank everybody for listening, watching, being here. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, Michael, for the talk. This was awesome and very enjoyable. Um, a couple announcements for everyone who's here. Uh, Michael will be back this Sunday and every Sunday doing the Dharma Doors, uh, opening a different Dharma Door every Sunday um, at 7 p.m. at the same link, um, probably in the same exact place where you are right now. Um, and uh, this Sunday, we're going to, we met Anatha Pandika last Sunday. Uh, and if you missed that, you can catch up on YouTube. And this Sunday, we're going to um, do the Advice to Anatha Pandika Sutta. Um, and that will conclude um, this month's uh, Dharma Doors. And then we're going to start the Vimalakirti Sutra for the next two months, which is going to be awesome. So don't miss that. Um, we also do, just so you know, particularly if you already have a practice, we do a morning sit now that we're online every single day uh, from 7.30 to 8.15. So drop by to the morning sit and practice in community. And if you have any friends who are just starting to meditate or who want to learn to meditate, on weekdays from 8.30 to 9, we have a really beginner-friendly sit. Um, this is a very good time to start meditating. So uh, bring a friend to that or tell a friend about that. That's at 8.30 in the morning. Um, and you can be part of our community and support our community supported Sangha. Um, so please donate if you can. We're committed to bringing the Dharma to everyone, uh, regardless of financial means. But if you can donate, um, it uh, allows us to continue doing what we're doing. And so I'm going to put into the chat, we just made this new donate link today. So uh, test it out, see if it works. Um, so it's a, it's like a custom PayPal link. It should have our logo on it. Uh, everybody click on it, um, and, uh, make sure that it works. Uh, we also have a Venmo. The Venmo is SF-Dharma-Collective. Uh, yeah, and come back on Sunday. So we're, we have the room, uh, for the whole night, so everyone's free to hang out.